Carlos and Credit, thank you very much. Um, good evening, everyone. When Carlos suggested I might give one of these talks, we agreed that I didn't really have a single topic that could entertain you for 45 minutes. And we thought we would vary the format and cover these tips, tricks, and pitfalls. And here's a list of what I'm going to go through. Uh, mostly, I don't remember where I learned these. Uh, some will learn the hard way for sure. Um, many will learn from my great colleagues, from our fellows, Carlos was one, and from our therapy colleagues. So if you see one of your tips, tricks, or pitfalls in what follows, forgive me if I don't make the attribution, but thanks anyway. Okay, let's, let's start with the open mallet finger injury. And this, in many ways, this is straightforward. We're going to make a repair. We need to remember this is an open joint injury very often, and so it needs a prompt washout and some antibiotic therapy. But what about the post-operative management? You think, well, we could split this, but how? The stack splint, which you see here on the left, is not going to do well over the dorsal wound. Remember that the splint works by three-point fixation, the pulp taping here and then pressure directly over the joint. Now, I've worn one of these on three separate occasions each for eight weeks and I can tell you that the skin here doesn't like it much. It's okay but it's uh, it gets red, it's tender, it, it's macerated and this is an area where it's perhaps not the best area for healing in the hand. So splintage is difficult and if you splint it gently it's going to flex at the terminal joint and in my experience patients hate a droop at the end of the finger even more than they hate a bit of loss of flexion. So my tip for this one is to pin it straight. Uh, then you can put on a gentle splint to protect it, um, keep the pin maybe for four weeks and then you can apply a, a different splint when the, uh, when, when the skin is a, is a bit more stable. And that's worked, worked very well for me. You might also consider it in this situation, a car's um, reminded me of this when we were talking last, last week. This was another open extensor tendon division at the terminal joint that became infected. Um, so here you need clearly a good deprimement. You need deep specimens for culture. You need good antibiotic therapy, but you also need a stable skeleton. And how to achieve that? Uh, well, there's no straightforward way other than with, with the good old pin. Uh, which in my experience, and Carlos tells me he likes it too, that's worked quite well. And the same applies for the central slip division over the PIP joint. There's really no way of holding that straight safely without a pin across the joint, which you'll need to put obliquely so that the joint's in full extension. Okay, that takes us on to mallet fracture. And this certainly is controversial. Should you splint it? or operate on it. And there's some examples, maybe not very good examples here on the right. Uh, <clears throat> what I've learned about mallet fracture is the capacity for remodeling is really quite extraordinary. I mean, admittedly, this one isn't subluxed, but it's healed pretty well. And the other thing I've learned is that you only ever see these late when the patient presents with something else. Actually, we see lots of people with arthritis of the terminal joint, but none of them are mallet fingers. These are two different cases, both cricketers, um, and they've both got dorsal fracture dislocations of the proximal interphalangeal joint, here and here. Um, this person has also broken through his old mallet injury. There's another one here, and I suspect there may be one there, and we didn't radiograph the other digits. Maybe they have more. So it's actually really unusual to see these late, regardless of how they're treated. Uh, what's in the literature? Not a great deal. Um, this study from Chicago of splintage of fractures with a substantial articular surface involvement showed no pain, good function, good satisfaction, but not, so satis not such satisfaction with the appearance. Um, and there's a recent randomized study, small study from Denmark, splinting versus extension block splinting, where splintage gave better motion, but three of them subluxed. Too small to know, I think, if that was... In fact, was really important. What we do know, this is from a, a well-known hand surgeon in Cincinnati, Peter Stern, who's, a, who's known to be a good reporter, a high complication rate for surgery. 
and there's a systematic review a couple of years ago, also from the US, where the authors concluded that the complication rate was about the same, so you could choose either treatment. What they rather gloss over is that the complications of splint were relatively minor, and the complications of surgery were more major. So the jury is really still out on this. I guess my main message is, if you're going to operate on it, be careful, warn the patient of what might happen. They do do pretty well with splintage. Okay, the dorsal fracture dislocation of the PIP joint. Um, the first sentence on this in Green's textbook says it's a difficult injury, and it certainly is. Many options for management. Um, here's our cricketer case with the breakthrough his old manet injury. And he came at about four days after injury. What, what to do about this? Well, we can see that the PIP joint is dorsally subluxed. In fact, the, the, one of the key radiographic signs here is the V sign just here. Compare it with the normal PIP joint in the adjacent digit. These surfaces just match each other here. Here we have the V sign and it's, it's gone dorsal. We started this one with extension block splintage, a method described by the Mayo Clinic where you flex the finger to a point where it's reduced and you let it flex from there, <clears throat> but block any further extension so it doesn't be dislocate. And every week you bring the splint out a bit, hoping it stays in joint. But our case uh, was rather swollen, would flex only to here, uh, and clearly we're still subluxed. Um, what to do about that? Well, I picked up a method from uh, that nice uh, surgeon, Brian Newington, who when he was a young man in Nottingham with others there reported this method, which is just to reduce the joint and pin it. Now you could argue that our pin could be better. It could be more in the mid-axial line and it could be a bit more longitudinal. But the joint's reduced. You see our V sign has disappeared. Uh, the bones are lined up uh, correctly. And this is really simple. Uh, much simpler than a hemihamate arthroplasty, than fixation of these fragments, or one of those uh, multiple k devices with elastic bands. <clears throat> My technical tip here is to bring the wire out through the far side so you can just palpate it under the skin, because if the wire should break, you want to be able to re retrieve both pieces. This is Diane Newington's paper. It's only 10 patients, but they were followed up for 16 years with no pain in seven out of 10. 85 degree arc of flexion and no severe degenerative change. I would commend it to you as a really uh, simple treatment, simple at the time of treatment and simple in terms of the post-operative management. So we move a bit proximally to the less common injury, dorsal MP joint dislocation, a hyperextension injury that ruptures the vertebral plate at its proximal membranous end. Um, and there are two types, simple and complex. And the paradox here is that the one with the more severe deformity is actually the simple one because the, it's usually at 90 degrees. And often you can reduce this closed provided you push here and push the vertebral plate that's draped over the head back into position. Conversely, if you pull, if you try and pull it straight, um, it'll pivot on here. This will flip up and the vertebral plate may get stuck on the dorsum, uh, which of course is what is present in the complex variety. Here are the sesamoids. Here's the vertebral plate here. This, this is a border digit injury. You very seldom see it in the middle of ring fingers unless it's part of something much bigger. Um, and there's controversy about how to approach this for surgery in the index finger. So let's go to Green's textbook. Um, it does mention the dorsal approach here briefly, but then it says the vertebral approach allows action, excellent visualization of any intrap structures. Well, the main entrap structure, everybody agrees, um, is the vertebral plate. And where is the vertebral plate? Well, it's lying, as we just saw, on the dorsal surface of the metacarpal head and neck. So if we ask one of our fellows, what's your best approach to the dorsal surface of the metacarpal? He or she won't say vertebra. Um, why is this? Well, it's all down to a, a very good paper by one of the greats of hand surgery, Emmanuel Kaplan in New York in 1957. It's only one case, but it's been cited 176 times, which is interesting. He gives a very good description of the history um, and of the anatomy with some nice diagrams. But his single case was a dorsal approach that failed 
requiring then an incision on, on, on the palmar side. Here's a couple of facts about Emmanuel Kaplan. You can read this in the paper shown below. And you can also read his, his um, interesting life history. Not listed here is the fact that he was almost executed by the revolutionary Russian army, but he was recognized just in time by a sergeant who had been a former patient and he was, he was spared. He wrote this great textbook in the um, 1953 and the later edition. And he's remembered, of course, also for Kaplan's line, crossing the palm from the palm of order of the extended thumb. And he records in, in his paper that the dorsal approach for this injury was described by Farabroff, a Paris surgeon in the late 19th century. So here are the illustrations from, from Kaplan's paper showing that the metacarpal head had come through between the flexor tendon and the lumbrical on either side, the natatory ligaments and the vertebral plate distally, and the superficial transverse ligament of the palmar fascia proximal. And this, his elegant description, and this rather neat diagram, I think has caught in people's minds. And that's the reason why this idea that you should go volar has been propagated in the literature, but actually dorsal is much easier. And my strong advice is, use the dorsal approach and if it doesn't work, which seems very rare, you could go from the palmar side because it gives you a good exposure of the vertebral plate, the digital nerves, often injured and the palmar approach is safe and you can deal with any fractures. So here's our dorsal approach. This is in an older child, just a short incision, easy to get past the extensor tendon and you drop into a cavity with the articular surface of the base of the proximal phalanx facing you and the vertebral plate lying on the metacarpal head. This is an image from Beckton's paper. Um, I think he made it, made an incision bigger just, just for the illustration, showing that you divide the vertebral plate longitudinally, the two halves will then fold either side of the metacarpal head and, it, and it's reduced and can be managed then with a great bandage usually. And there's some evidence published recently that that's, is the right approach. Here are 21 cases from a center in the US, 14 vertebral approaches and six of them failed. They had to go dorsal whereas none of the dorsal approaches now. So that's a, that, that's a strong tip. Uh, and a pitfall if you go, the pitfall if you go volar, of course, is injury to the radial digital nerve. And we should remember because the nerve has to come from the midline as it leaves the median nerve towards the index finger, it crosses the proximal palmar crease in the midline of the index ray, exactly where the metacarpal head might come forward. Uh, this is probably an even less common uh, problem in the in the finger. I mention it only because if you haven't seen it, it's a real puzzle. It's a locked metacarpophalangeal joint, and there are several causes which the literature will tell you about, but the commonest one is in older individuals who typically grasp firmly on something narrow, um, there's some pain and the joint won't fully extend. It'll, it'll flex quite well, um, and typically the radiograph shows osteoarthritis of the MP joint, and you might need oblique views to show it, but also a proximally pointing osteophyte that is snagged on the palmar plate. Um, and some people have said you can distend the joint with saline and float it off. I've never made that work. And the surgical correction is straightforward uh, through a zigzag incision to expose the flexor tendons, to release part or all of the A1 pulley, to pull the tendons to the radial side revealing these lovely transverse fibers in the vertebral plate with its membranous proximal portion. And then if you incise the palmar plate longitudinally, uh, we're looking at the head of the metacarpal here, a bit of an osteophyte here. And with your forceps, you'll find you can pull up one edge of the divided vertebral plate and look in the joint. But you can't pull the other, the other surface up, it's tethered. So you put the forceps in here and sweep them over the palmar surface of the metacarpal head and lo and behold, you reveal this pointed osteophyte that's been snagged on the vertebral plate. And this can be nibbled off and you're done. Okay. This has been one of my favorite techniques described for the fifth metacarpal neck by Guy Fouché in Strasbourg. And these are the points he makes in his paper. He makes a decent incision, which I think is a good idea because it helps you to protect the dorsal sensory branch of the ulnar nerve. And of course, if injured could give you far more trouble than any metacarpal fracture. Uh, he didn't use radiographic control, but I think we should. And he left the ends long enough to remove them easily, but I'm not sure why you really need to remove them. Um, and these are the bits of equipment 
that you need. You need a drill, which I'd use by hand. Remember, if you put it on power, you might rather easily go through the other side and then your wires will always follow the wrong track. So your drill and a drill guide, a pin to use for fixation, pliers to hold the pin, and the hammer is to hit the pliers while they're holding the pin. I find that an easier way to get it in than just trying to, try to push it. I think it's more controlled. And the very fine tipped strong wire cutters to cut the pin as short as you can. So um, this, this isn't my case, and I, I wouldn't bend the wires like this, but um, it shows how they're inserted, uh, rather like a bouquet of flowers, um, but those, I guess, will need to be removed. We don't often fix metacarpal neck fractures, but these are, are more common and are quite amenable to the same technique. The difficulties you might encounter in the ring finger, um, well, firstly, you need a dorsal entry point, you can't get around to the side. Secondly, the canal is often very narrow, and you may find if you get one pin, one thin pin across, that's all you can get in, and it, you might not think it was strong enough. So often I'd use a slightly stouter pin and just plan to use one. If the fracture is displaced, this segment between the fracture and the joint is quite unstable, um, and it's difficult often to get a good reduction. Remember that um, although it may look as though your medullary canals are 50% overlapped on the radiograph, the area they have in common is actually very small. And a, a, a good tip for being able to control that fragment is just to put a joystick pin in it here, and then you can move it around, makes it easy to get the pin across. Um, and then we cut the pins flush. I think we, should, we could have cut them shorter than this. My technique for, for cutting the pins and avoiding them sticking up is to uh, get a good view with retractors in, in the wound, to take the end of the pin and lift it, but only through the phase of um, elastic deformation. So when you cut it, the end will spring back. If you bend it into the phase of plastic deformation, then you'll be left with a bend on the end. So I like a nice tip in a paper by Nicholas Barton, from, sorry, by, paper by, by Tim Davis from, from uh, Nottingham. Um, he taps them in a bit, to come a bit further down the metacarpal till the end is level with the hole, and then taps the end, the end into the hole. Complications, well, the most, the most serious is damage to the dorsal branch of the, uh, of the arm and nerve. You can have problems with the wires. But to my mind, the great benefit of this technique is that when your non-compliant patient hits something again, this is the worst that happens. And then I, you just say, good luck to them. Um, whereas if you've plated a metacarpal shaft fracture, you've got a, a loose plate or a broken plate, the screws are pulled out, the fracture may not have healed, and that's a much bigger problem. Oh, I'll just digress to a tip about um, insert, about drilling small bones in the hand. Quite easy to drill through too far, especially if it's in cancellous bone, where you don't get that good feel of the two cortices. Um, and it's a particular problem if they hand you a three kilogram drill rather than the small one shown here. So my tip is my thumb of the, the non-drilling hand goes on the body of the instrument and the index finger goes on the part near to the site of drilling. For clarity, we haven't shown the essential drill guide here, but that can be hold, held by an assistant, or actually there is a way of holding it in, in, in your other digits. But you get a very precise proprioceptive feel, feel here to control the depth of drilling. Oh, and another fracture fixation tip. So you've got reasonable exposure. You're trying to keep the fracture reduced from the plating position at the same time drill your important first hole. And it's quite difficult to control all those variables at, at, at the same time. Uh, my, my tip, I don't know where this came from, is to line the plate up, uh, take your pen, make a dot through the hole, take the plate away. In fact, you, the fracture doesn't need to be reduced at this stage. You can simply drill your first hole and go from there. Okay, moving down the digit, what are your options for this angulated displaced fracture of the shaft of the proximal phalanx? Um, is a good reduction important? Well, it certainly is because the periosteum on the palmar side is the dorsal wall of the flexor tendon sheath, number one. Number two, the dorsal aponeurosis is exquisitely sensitive to changes in length, either absolute changes because of shortening of the fracture or relative changes because of angulation. <coughs> and any <coughs> shortening of the fracture will cause a droop at the PIP joint. And of course, in a swollen digit, that's very likely to lead 
to a flexion contracture of the PIP joint. Um, I've always liked this technique from authors in the east of the US, which I think they used to do in the emergency room because he's wearing an apron and gloves and, <laughs> and, and it's on a, on a T-handle here. You take a statish wire and just put it straight through the head of the metacarpal, down the proximal fragment, into the reduced distal fragment, and there you are. But more flexed than is shown in the diagram. It needs to be flexed as, flexed as much as you can. Yeah. It's really simple. If you try and pin to either side in this way, you can do the borders radial on the side, but the, uh, doing it in the middle of the hands, hand is really tricky and the soft tissues don't like it. So here's, here's an example, an older gentleman with three basal fractures uh, with dorsal angulation. Of course, the, the, um, it's often difficult to get, idea, get a good idea of the angulation on, on these radiographs. All, all we know is that the, as with hand radiographs generally, the problem is at least as bad as it looks on the worst radiograph, but it could be worse. So these have been reduced, um, we think, and pinned. Then there's a cast, it needs to go from the forearm across the MP joints, across the PIP joints, but leave the terminal joints free because if there's too much movement, there's a risk of breaking the pins. Um, here's the guy, I think, between six and eight weeks after surgery, he goes fully straight. Uh, he makes, makes a good fist. These are injuries that quite easily lead to stiffness if that deformity is not corrected. I've been taught a lot by some of my older hand fracture patients who didn't come right away. This lady, a 65 year old gardener, came in about four days with this nasty fracture of the ring metacarpal, also an injury of the proximal phalanx of the small finger. Um, and our fellow is busy working out what sort of plate we need to bridge this and do we need less screws. But when you look at the hand, there's no rotational deformity. Uh, the lady's got about 40% of the range of finger flexion. And she's saying she doesn't, doesn't specially want an operation. So we thought we'd just run with it and, and also stop taking radiographs because they only worry you, really. Um, and uh, we saw it after a week, the movement was improving. There was still no rotational problem. Um, and when we saw her, I guess this is probably five weeks after the injury, she's, she's still a bit swollen. The injured left ring finger is a little short, but she hasn't noticed that. Um, she's got very good flexion, but she has noticed that, but she's not concerned about it really. So we saved, saved NHS resources. Uh, we, we, we saved her an operation and, and a scar, and we actually got a, a pretty good result. We couldn't really have done better with an operation. So we all need to treat the Bennett's fracture. Should this be pinning or internal fixation? Well, I think there's general agreement that if the fracture is small, the issue is an unstable dislocation and that can be managed by manipulation and a pin. What to do if the fracture is bigger? Um, pinning or open reduction? Actually, the literature says that these tend to do pretty well if you pin them. There are a few long-term studies. They mostly show, show the patients have pretty good function on examination. They got some lumpiness and some loss of movement. And on x-rays, they got some arthritis, but it is rather a tolerant joint of articular incongruity. Um, there's some evidence um, not too long ago in, uh, from a, a center in America where they took eight cadaver thumbs, made a small incision, created a largish fragment by osteotomy, then closed their wound, and then went ahead, went ahead with pinning and fluoroscopy. Uh, pinning and manipulation under, under fluoroscopy and the, and the fluoroscope showed they were all acceptable, whatever that means. The plain radiograph immediately afterwards showed a bit of a step off. When they opened the thumbs, they had three millimeters of displacement and 2.9 millimeters of step off. And I guess we've all been there really, haven't we? And the fluor fluoroscope look, looks good, but it doesn't always tell the true story. How much does this matter? We don't really know. Um, but I've always felt it was important in a situation like this to, to get the best reduction you can. And the best way to do that is to open it, which is pretty straightforward, um, to reduce it, which even with it open is not always so easy. And to fix it with two screws, then you need to create bandage and you can mobilize it early. This is the, the Moberg approach. Watch out for a dorsal sensory branch of the radial nerve. It often runs to the, in the dorsal edge of the incision, but it's easy to protect there because it's running along the line of that part of the incision. More tricky are one or two little nerve fibers that often run across the transverse component. So it's worth warning the patient they might get a patch of numbness here or a bit of sensitivity um, in the scar. Um, 
Uh, what's known about the long-term results, and here's a study from Edinburgh with 11 year follow-up, quite good length of follow-up, and, and pretty satisfied patients, all treated by pinning, in fact. So we don't really know from the paper how big the fragments were. And you could criticize it on the relatively low response rate, 62 out of 143, but that's a you know, common problem in young people with hand fractures. This is a more tricky problem. This young man in his mid twenties came to see us about five months after a Bennett's fracture sustained overseas and it was untreated. He has pain that really isn't acceptable to him. What to do? Well, the salvage options are fusion. Seems a bit drastic. The joint looks pretty good on the, on, on the, on the other view. Um, he's a bit, he's too young for excision arthroplasty. I, I went to the literature to see what people said about this and found this nice paper, only two cases by Blair and Jepson from, from Iowa City. And they made this approach. Um, and the, the important features of the procedure, they said, and I, that's been my experience too, is firstly, you need to, of course, to have warned the patient that if the joint surface looks badly damaged, you either have to bail out or use another option. Secondly, you follow the hyaline cartilage back till you find the fibro cartilage um, that has formed in the gap. And then you need to remove the bone that's formed in the gap because otherwise you'll never reduce this into, into position. And having done that and stabilized the fragment in, with your chosen method, you'll then find the joint is still a bit sloppy. I think probably because the dorsal ligaments have been stretched while it's been out of joint. Um, and so you also need to pin the joint. So here we have two pins holding the fragment, a larger pin holding the joint, that's in for six weeks, the other pin's in for eight weeks. Um, joint pin removed, other pin will be removed later. And now at about four or five months, uh, it's the left hand, the one on your right that was injured. He's got pretty good extension. He's got pretty good flexion, not quite as good as the other side. Um, and his pain is largely better. Uh, we had another case with much more articular surface damage, which required a primary fusion. This is a tension band fixation with a sliding bone graft, which of course avoids the need to take bone graft from elsewhere. The graft comes from the dorsal surface of the proximal part of the metacarpal and is slid into a trough cut into the, into the trapezium. And the technical tip here is to make both troughs, slight, troughs slightly wedge-shaped from distal to proximal. Of course, if you made this strictly rectangular, you could cut the trapezium slot to, to, to fit snugly. But when you slid it down, it would be loose in here because of the little gap where you'd remove bone. If you make it wedge-shaped, it'll slide down. And as this moves down to here, um, then it, it'll wedge in and be more stable. Okay, pharyngeal neck fractures, um, not so common, often a children's injury. Of course, remodeling potential small because there's no physis and the imaging can be difficult, particularly in small kids. Uh, and particularly when you've wrapped the hand up after treatment, it's difficult to get a good lateral view. I just want to cover a tip for um, a problem that may occur if you have a malunion. So this is an older, older child. And the problem, of course, is loss of flexion of the PIP joint because the volar rim of the middle phalanx abuts on the spike. Um, and here's a clinical case. This is a different case, is much further out from injury. And you can see how there's no flexion at the PIP joint. And as a compensation, the patients develop this excessive flexion of the terminal joint, which of course is due to, to stretching out of the oblique retinacular ligament. Well, again, if you go to the literature, which we did, You'll find this nice paper by Barry Simmons from Boston, given the rather um, rather fancy name of subcondylar fossa reconstruction. It's not really a reconstruction, it's, it's, it's an excision. Uh, and I, I don't have radiographs or imaging of this patient, but I've um, done a Photoshop job on the images of the radiograph I showed before. Because in order to allow the base of the middle phalanx to come all the way around the infection, you need to recreate the subcondylar fossa, which I've done by Photoshop here, not with rangers. Um, I would caution, of course, that you shouldn't do it at this early stage, because this is relatively weak, and if it breaks during or after your procedure, you have a really difficult problem on your hands. Um, so wait, wait for all of this to be, uh, to be fully mature. And in our case, we got back good but not normal flexion of the proximal interphalangeal joint. Subcondylar fossa decision or reconstruction. Oh, a technical tip for trapeziectomy. 
And I chose this really graph because it shows the trapezium nicely, not because it has osteoarthritis. So for this, you need to get your operating room staff to reach into the cupboard for one of their oldest instruments, which is this, um, and find a largest drill and make a drill hole um, from the surface of the trapezium you expose through to the other side. And you do this by turning the drill slowly and um, every now and again, remove it while still turning, which clears the debris and look in the hole to see if you're through the other side. Um, you can look in, you can probe it with your forceps and eventually you'll come gently through the other side. But of course, be careful not to overdo it because the FCR tendon is here and the median nerve is right about here. So you've made your hole. Now with some traction on the thumb to open up these joints, you take your rangeurs. One jaw goes in the hole, one jaw goes in the joint, go in as deep as you can, the full width, length of the depth of the trapezium and bite and bite a, bite a couple of times more here and here remove this bone here and the same on the proximal side to leave excised bone something like this. Then of course you, you're able to flex to, to, um, to push these bits to rotate them towards the middle and that makes it much easier to get to the ligament attachment for holding the bone all the way around. And I've never removed this bone in one piece I don't know if it's uh, if it's easy to do uh, maybe you could tell me uh, but this seems to me to be an easier method. Hold this bit in it gives you easier access over here. And of course, remember that as you're marching in this dorsal direction, your first landmark is the joint between the trapezium and the, and the trapezoid, and that's the place to stop. Okay, I came to this tip for injection of trigger finger rather late in my career, and I wish I could remember who taught it to me. Now, of course, there's debate about whether you need to inject inside the sheath or whether outside the sheath will work just as well. But if you're planning to inject inside the sheath, this is a good way to do it. Mostly we inject, many, I was taught to inject with the finger straight. But if you inject with the finger flexed, your first um, task is to spear the tendon. And that's easy, that's you know, like shooting fish in the barrel. You, we can all spear the tendon because you can't inject well needles in, in the tendon. Then, if you, and if you take the syringe off the needle, leave the needle in place, you'll see what happens. Because when you straighten the finger, and I've mimicked it with my arrows here, as you straighten the finger, the flexor tendon pulls off the needle, leaving the needle behind inside the sheath. And the needle will then flatten off, it'll come and lie down against the palm, and you can reapply your syringe and, and inject. And that's, for me, that's worked really well. Maybe, maybe one of you was the person who taught me that and can remind me. Early in my training, when I was taught to release a trigger finger, it was through a transverse incision. And that was always, uh, I found a bit, well, it, I never, could never quite get it in the right place. Sometimes it wasn't it was a bit too distal, a bit too proximal, and it wasn't too easy. If that's your favorite incision, here's a useful landmark, because this study showed that the distance between the PIP joint crease and the proximal digital crease is pretty much the same as the distal between that distance between that crease and the proximal edge of the A1 pulley. And you can use your Atkins forceps as a pair of dividers to measure and mark. Um, but after Clay Palmer's paper came out in 1989, I immediately switched to the longitudinal incision and did it ever since because it's, it's simpler, it's quick. As long as you don't transgress the scar, the, the, the creases either side, it, the, the, the scarring is perfectly acceptable. Um, another procedure I came to a bit too late is this one. Um, some trigger fingers are troublesome. There's a flexion contracture, or there may be a persistence of A1 pulley release or a recurrence. And those problems are more common in diabetes than in people without diabetes. So I knew about the procedure from the work of these two surgeons who wrote a lot about the rheumatoid hand from Denver. They preferred not to release the A1 pulley because of the risk of inducing alder drift. Um, and so they resected one slip of the, of the superficialis tendon. Um, but I came to it after the paper by Dominique Liviette from Paris. Um, so through your palm incision, you, re you release the arm pulley. With a hook, you pull in the gap between the two bits of the FDS and make a bevel division where it joins the other slip proximally. And then through this incision, you divide this midline connection to the other slip and, and excise it. Um, and there's a, there's a very good animation and video at the website of Charles Eaton, the hand surgeon in Florida. Um, and I, I would commend that to you. He has a neat trick using a loop of wire for extracting the FDS slip from proximal to distal. Um, 
<clears throat> fusions in the hand. You know, this for some of you who've recently taken the exam, maybe you got this this question. It's quite a common exam question. Now, to the candidate, what are the indications for arthrodesis? And everybody knows about arthritis, but people may forget instability, the, the causes, and also for contraction. Of course, there's a long history and many of the techniques are obsolete. Um, and the thinking on this really changed with the development of tension band wiring from these authors in the AO community um, in the early 1980s. Um, and there are, there are several studies showing that it's far better than its predecessors, pins and cast, for example, in this study had much higher infection and non-union rates than tension band wiring. And also from also another study from, from Peter Stern, only 3% non-union in almost 300 cases. So the, the principles of fusion, um, generally linear incisions. I don't like around the distal joint, any incision that looks like a letter at the end of the alphabet. I think you're much better with a straight incision, which will open up to give sufficient exposure. Then you need this formal division of the collateral ligament origins by sliding a blade underneath them through the origins of collateral and accessory collateral until you can run your blunt instrument all the way around into the subcondylar fossa. Then you can pull the, prop, the distal bone forwards and get access to expose it. Expose can cellist bone, not just the bone under the cartilage and avoid burning the bone. And then you know, the modern principle, of course, is stable, accurate apposition, stable fixation, buried metal, and then you can rehabilitate it quickly. Now, my technical tips for the tension band are Firstly, at least in theory, you ought to have a stable construct of bone on the opposite side so the tension band can operate. Don't have the pins through too far. Have a decent bridge so it here so the wire doesn't cut out. Wires crossed at the level of the, the fusion and the pins flush as much as you can. And here's my tip for getting a pin flush. So here's our tension band, the red is for the pin. Eyeball the angle, say it's 30 degrees. Um, plan to bend this up by 30 plus a little bit. And the best instrument is this thing like a tie lever that's on the on the AO set. Um, so we've bent it up and now you take the pliers and swivel it through 180 degrees until it's flush on the bone surface. Works a treat. But the distal joint, two main tips here. The first is template the, uh, the radiograph on the lateral view to make sure that your planned intermolary screw, which is now the standard technique, is not going to be too large. Um, and then drill by hand. If, if you use a candidated system uh, with a fine pin on a power drill, it'll tend to go wherever you point it, which may not be the right direction. Whereas if you drill by hand down the Vidari Canal, it'll generally find the correct route. Uh, you see the drill protrude here under the skin, the stand incision at the tip, drill the middle phalanx then, and then the screws inserted from distal to proximal, bring it down to the level of the, the joint and a couple of threads beyond that. So you can then lift the bone up, engage, see the screw engage into the hole in the middle phalanx, and then hold it compressed either yourself or within line of systems as the screws inserted. Um, it gives, in good bone, it gives an extremely strong fix that doesn't need um, uh, external support. People sometimes say, oh, it'll, my finger will be too straight. Or colleagues say, you don't want the finger straight. But the shape of the bone and the way the soft tissues are arranged generally means it looks 10 to, 10 to 15 degrees flexed, even though you've fixed, the, fixed it down to the diary canal. Yeah, this is why you need to take template, because not all bones are large enough to accommodate all screws. And a good indication is this one, psoriatic arthropathy. Um, with progressive bone loss. And if you don't deal with this quickly by fusion, it may become impossible. So here we are with screws and three digits. So those are the principles. We'll skip on. Uh, yeah, a couple more tips. So you don't often see this uh, in the absence of um, inflammatory arthropathy. You don't often see this sort of tenosynovitis. Is it gout? Could it be amyloid? Uh, this case was referred from elsewhere where the histology of material removed um, at surgery was said to be synovial chondromatosis, but our pathologist wasn't very convinced with that when he reviewed the section. So we took more specimens, and including the key specimen, of course, which is, I can hear you all say it, cultures, especially cultures for atypical mycobacteria, because this is this was Mycobacterium avium intracellularum, and it took 
uh, two lots of um, antibiotic treatment over about two and a half years to get it clear. Um, this is another one. This 50-year-old um, chap was referred after three or four drainages of a rather indolent infection of the index finger uh, that kept recurring. And when we looked at the whole limb, there was a little lesion here, doesn't you too? Go too well in the picture, and another little, little lesion here in the skin or subcutaneous tissues, and possibly something over here. This is sporotrichoid spread, spread along the lymphatics. This was Mycobacterium marinum, uh, which resolved on the appropriate antibiotic therapy. Another problem that can mimic infection is this one. Um, a mono looks like a monoarthropathy. Is this an infection? Is this a rheumatological disorder? It's painful, it's stiff. The examination shows quite a vigorous synovitis. And again, I can hear some of you saying, you, you know what this is. Um, there's the radiograph and you look closely, you can't see anything, but if you sit back a bit and look at the head of the head and neck of the proximal phalanx, can you see here a lucency with a slightly more dense bit of bone in, in the middle? Of course, this is, an osteoid osteoma. And in my experience, this is quite a common place in the old subcondylar fossa again, producing and close to joints, these can produce quite a, a, a vigorous synovitis. And there it is on the CT in here. So quite straightforward to remove through a mid axial approach with the relief of the problem. And finally, um, this is an indolent swelling, it's been present for several months. Um, is it an infection? She was age 30, initially treated with antibiotics, then incision and drainage, then a marginal incision, um, and, it, and it recurred. There it is again, and there's this surgical scar. Again, I can probably hear one or two people thinking, thinking they know what this is. This is an epithelioid sarcoma. Sometimes it looks like, like an indolent infection. Well, that's the final slide to show it's time for me to shut up. So <laughs> thank you very much for your attention.